Thank you for joining your Desert Frontiersman, Alan, for more Southwest adventures. Please leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. Relax and enjoy these lost tales. Welcome, listeners, to today's episode where we'll be exploring the fascinating history of Fort Bowie, a crucial outpost in the American Southwest that played a significant role in the Apache Wars. Nestled in the heart of what was once Apache territory, Fort Bowie stood as a sentinel, guarding one of the most treacherous stretches of road in the United States, Apache Pass. Picture this. It's the mid-19th century, and the road to California runs through a narrow, winding defile in southeastern Arizona known as Apache Pass. This eight-mile stretch of road witnessed more bloodshed than perhaps any other in the United States at that time. It was here in the heart of Cochise's Apache Empire, that countless ambushes took place, claiming the lives of stagecoach passengers, wagon train settlers, lone travelers, and U.S. cavalry troops. The pass, located between the Chiricahua Mountains to the south and the Dos Cabezas Mountains to the north, was an ideal location for the Apache warriors to stage their attacks. The rocky terrain provided perfect cover, allowing them to strike swiftly and retreat just as quickly. It's no wonder that locals began referring to it as Bloody Apache Pass. The story of Fort Bowie begins about a century ago, around the 1850s. At that time, Apache Pass was part of a vital route for travelers crossing the southern desert to reach California. Initially, this road ran through Mexican territory. However, the Gadsden Purchase of 1853 brought this land under U.S. control, increasing traffic through the pass. For these early travelers, water was the most precious commodity. The road through Apache Pass was dotted with water holes spaced about a day's journey apart. Travelers could find water at locations like Steins Pass, San Simon Cienaga, Apache Pass itself, Sulphur Springs, Dragoon Spring, the San Pedro River, Relito Creek, and finally, Tucson. This made Apache Pass not just strategically important for travel, but literally a lifeline in the harsh desert environment. In 1858, the first Butterfield Overland Mail stagecoach from St. Louis to San Francisco wound its way through Apache Pass. Leaving St. Louis on September 15th, it arrived in San Francisco on October 10th, covering an impressive 2,535 miles in just 25 days, a record for stage travel at the time. This new mail route brought increased traffic through Apache Pass and with it, increased danger. The tension between the Apache and the newcomers came to a head in 1860 with what became known as the Bascom Affair. Lieutenant George Bascom, a young and inexperienced officer, arranged a meeting with the renowned Apache leader Cochise under a flag of truce. However, what was meant to be a peaceful negotiation quickly turned into a disastrous confrontation. Bascom, acting on faulty intelligence, attempted to take Cochise prisoner. The Apache chief managed to escape, slashing his way out of the tent, but some of his warriors were captured by the soldiers. In retaliation, Cochise captured several white prospectors and a stage station attendant. What followed was a tragic series of events that would ignite years of conflict. Cochise offered to exchange his white prisoners for the captured Apache warriors. When Bascom refused, Cochise made the grim decision to execute the white prisoners within sight of the soldiers. The U.S. troops responded in kind, selecting a sturdy oak tree and hanging their Apache captives. This incident marked a turning point. Cochise, feeling betrayed and enraged, declared war on the whites. For the next 12 years, this war would be waged with great cruelty on both sides, turning Apache Pass into an even more dangerous gauntlet for travelers to run. The outbreak of the Civil War in 1861 further complicated matters in Apache Pass. As U.S. troops were withdrawn from the territory to fight in the east, 
the Apaches were left in virtual control of the region. However, the war also indirectly led to the establishment of Fort Bowie. In response to Lincoln's call for volunteers, California organized a group known as the California Column. These volunteers initially hoped to be sent east as combat troops. However, due to concerns about the loyalty of some men and the risk of desertion to the Confederacy, the Army instead tasked them with defending Arizona and New Mexico against Indian raids. In 1862, the California Volunteers occupied some of the abandoned Army posts and built new ones. Among these new outposts was Fort Bowie, named in honor of Colonel George W. Bowie of the California Volunteers. Fort Bowie's establishment was preceded by a significant battle. In July 1862, a force consisting of three companies of infantry and one of cavalry left Tucson for New Mexico, following the Apache Pass route. As they approached the pass, Cochise and his warriors, joined by the forces of another prominent Apache leader, Mangas Coloradas, prepared an ambush. The Apache had carefully constructed rock redoubts, blending them with the natural outcroppings of the hillsides to block the path to the crucial water supply. However, the Californians were prepared for trouble. They had brought along two howitzers, which would prove decisive in the coming fight. As the troops neared the pass, their scouts sensed danger. When the hidden Apaches opened fire, the soldiers quickly wheeled their howitzers into position and began lobbing shells onto the hillsides. The exploding shells were something the Apache had never encountered before. One Apache later reported that it seemed as if the soldiers were shooting wagon wheels into their defenses. Faced with this unexpected and terrifying weapon, the Apache warriors fled in panic. Cochise attempted a second attack when the wagon train carrying supplies entered the pass, but again, the Native Americans were defeated. This battle, which took place on July 14, 1862, was possibly Cochise's worst defeat with over 60 of his braves killed. The U.S. forces, in contrast, suffered only two killed and three wounded. Recognizing the strategic importance of Apache Pass, General James Henry Carlton of the California Column ordered the immediate construction of a fort. Fort Bowie was quickly erected, its buildings constructed without delay. However, its presence didn't immediately diminish the Apache threat. The dangers of Apache Pass remained very real. Mail was scheduled to arrive at the fort from Tucson once a week, but in a period of just 16 months, the Native Americans killed 22 mail carriers. The peril was so great that stage drivers and mail carriers were offered pay bonuses for risking the dangers of Apache Pass. Over the next few decades, Fort Bowie would play a crucial role in the ongoing conflicts with the Apache. After the Civil War, regular soldiers replaced the volunteer troops, though many of the California volunteers remained in the surrounding country as ranchers and farmers. The fort saw its share of notable figures and events. Major Sumner, son of a famous Civil War general, commanded the fort for a brief term. General George Crook, for whom the Crook National Forest is named, made Fort Bowie his headquarters during a period when he was working to persuade many fugitive Native Americans to return from Mexico to the San Carlos Reservation. Perhaps most famously, the legendary Apache leader Geronimo was held at Fort Bowie after his surrender in 1886. He remained there until the army was ready to transport him by train to Fort Pickens, Florida. Two years later, he was reunited with his family and removed to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. As the 19th century drew to a close, the need for Fort Bowie began to diminish. The completion of the Southern Pacific Railroad across Arizona in 1881 changed travel patterns. The railroad followed an easier grade around the Dos Cabezas Mountains and through Railroad Pass, and the overland route soon followed suit. Apache Pass was used less frequently, and the threat from Apache raids had largely subsided. 
In 1897, the U.S. government made the decision to abandon Fort Bowie in favor of fewer, larger posts. The fort that had stood as a desert sentinel for 35 years was no longer needed. Its buildings were sold at auction, with anything worth salvaging being removed. The roofs were torn off for the lumber, and even the ice plant was sold and relocated to Thatcher, Arizona. Today, Fort Bowie stands as a silent witness to a tumultuous period in American history. Its ruins serve as a reminder of the conflicts between cultures, the hardships of frontier life, and the changing face of the American West. As we reflect on the history of Fort Bowie and Apache Pass, we're reminded of the importance of understanding our past, with all its complexities and contradictions. The blood-soaked earth of Apache Pass has long since dried, but the lessons of this history remain relevant today. And so, dear listeners, we come to the end of our journey through the history of Fort Bowie and Apache Pass. We hope this exploration has given you a new perspective on this fascinating chapter of American history. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep learning from the echoes of our past. Welcome to another episode of the Southwest Desert, where we dive into the fascinating stories of the American Southwest. Today, we're exploring the life of Herman Wolf, an enigmatic figure who established one of the earliest trading posts in the Navajo country of northern Arizona. His story is one of survival, determination, and mystery in a time when the West was still wild. Our tale begins over 100 years ago, during the heyday of the fur trade in the American West. Herman Wolf, a tall man with prematurely gray hair, arrived in the region west of the Rockies, drawn by the lure of trapping. In 1838, he rode with the legendary Kit Carson's mountain men, just as the beaver trade was beginning to decline due to changing fashions in Europe. That same year, Wolf joined forces with Billy Mitchell from Ohio and Fred Smith from Texas. These three men roamed far and wide across the Southwest, but found themselves disheartened by the disappearance of both beaver and the once lucrative beaver trade. A letter from Fred Smith, written in Taos in 1845, gives us a glimpse into Wolfe's character. Smith described him as extremely moody and silent, but also noted his reputation as a formidable fighter. According to Smith, Wolfe was known for never backing down from a fight and had gained notoriety for his skill in conflicts with Native Americans. One particular incident in Taos illustrates Wolfe's temperament. When a man named Jose Baca attempted to rob him, Wolf, who had been minding his own business and not drinking, responded with swift and decisive action. He struck Baca with a boot, and when others joined in to attack him, shot Baca dead. This event led Wolf and his companions to quickly leave Taos. In 1846, as the American army took control of the Southwest, Wolf made his way to the Little Colorado River. Between what is now Winslow and Grand Falls, he found the river lined with willows and some remaining beaver. He set about trapping them, working his way down into the Grand Canyon and its tributaries. However, the life of a trapper in this region was fraught with danger. In the spring of 1848, near present-day Holbrook, Wolf had a close encounter with Apache raiders. They robbed him of every fur he had packed on two large mules, though he managed to escape with his life. For the next several years, Wolf's movements are somewhat unclear. He was seen in various locations across the West, including the Green River Valley in Utah and back in Taos. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he left Taos, supposedly heading for St. Louis, Missouri. For the next five years, there is no record of his activities, though it's believed he may have served on one side or the other in the conflict. After the war, Wolf reappeared in Taos and Santa Fe. In 1866, he once again ventured into Arizona, following the Rio Puerco to its junction with the Little Colorado, and then west along that stream. 
Despite the presence of roving bands of Navajo, Paiute, and Apache along the river, he emerged in the spring of 1867 with a successful haul of furs. The spring of 1868 proved to be a turning point in Wolfe's life. During a trapping expedition, he was ambushed by Apaches in Tucker Flat, between Winslow and the river. In a display of the fighting prowess that had made him legendary, Wolfe turned on his attackers, killing four and fighting his way through to the north side of the river with his pack animals intact. This close call seems to have prompted Wolfe to establish a more permanent presence in the region. That summer, he returned to the Little Colorado, this time accompanied by three Mexicans and nearly a score of mules and horses laden with trade goods. He chose a spot on the south side of the river, about 12 miles below Hopi Ford, near what is now Loop, Arizona. Here, Wolf constructed what would become the first trading post in the region. It was a simple but defensible structure built of cottonwood and willow logs set vertically in a trench. The single room measured approximately 40 by 20 feet, with no windows and only slitted holes for rifle fire. The flat roof was made of poles covered with red clay. The establishment of Wolf's trading post coincided with significant changes in the region. The Navajo were moving west from Bosque Redondo, where most of them had been forcibly relocated in 1864. Meanwhile, Apache raiders were active in the area, with some reportedly lurking in caves in Canyon Diablo, ambushing travelers on the California Santa Fe Trail. The first customers at Wolf's Post were Hopi people from villages 50 miles to the north, followed by Paiute tribesmen and Havasupais from Willow Springs and Moncopi. Eventually, some Navajo who had evaded relocation also began to trade at the post. Wolf's relationship with the local Native American leaders was complex. Buguetan, a local Navajo chief, was friendly but known to be tricky. Another chief, Hostine Redshirt, became a valuable ally, making it possible for Wolf to remain in the area. This alliance proved crucial, as Wolf often relied on Navajo protection against raids from other tribes. Life at the trading post was far from peaceful. In September 1868, a party of about 50 Paiutes killed nine Hopi traders just south of Newberry Mesa. The Paiutes then surrounded Wolf's post, attempting to break in and eventually setting one corner of the stockade on fire. Wolf and his Mexican helpers managed to drive off the attackers and extinguish the fire, but the danger was far from over. Just ten days later, the post was attacked by Apaches at dawn. One of Wolf's Mexican helpers was killed, another wounded, and the third fled during the fight. Wolf fought alone until Navajo allies arrived to drive off the Apaches. These attacks took their toll on trade, prompting Wolf to return to trapping for a time. It was during this period that the post received its Navajo name, Beaver House, due to the drying beaver pelts on frames. Wolf himself became known as Mr. Beaver. As the 1870s progressed, the region began to change. The California Santa Fe Trail crossing northern Arizona became more heavily traveled. This gave Wolf new outlets for his Native American products and furs, as well as new sources for supplies. Mormon immigrants began passing by Wolf's trading post in the summer of 1874, marking the beginning of increased white settlement in the area. This brought new challenges, including several robberies by white outlaws. In response to these changes and increasing dangers, Wolf decided to upgrade his trading post in 1880. He erected a new square post made of red sandstone a few hundred feet east of the old stockade on higher ground. This new structure included a store, kitchen, and bedroom. The arrival of the railroad at Canyon Diablo in 1881 brought dramatic changes to the region. A small boom town sprang up, though it was short-lived. For Wolf, the railroad provided easier access to trade goods, but it also signaled the end of the old frontier way of life. 
As he aged, Wolf spent less time actively trading and more time sitting in a chair while clerks handled the business. He maintained some contact with relatives in Germany and occasionally received barrels of bottled Rhine wine. As with many frontier figures, Wolf's life became surrounded by mystery and legend. Stories circulated that he had buried his wealth somewhere near the trading post or in the River Canyon. These tales were fueled by occasions when Wolf was seen leaving the post and returning with a leather sack of gold coins. In 1885, five white outlaws, believing these stories, broke into the post at night and demanded Wolf reveal his hidden hoard. When he denied having any money, they tortured him with hot wires on his feet. Navajo traders found him unconscious the next day and revived him. From then on, Wolf became even more wary of strangers and always kept his doors barred. As the 1890s drew to a close, Wolf's health began to decline. In the spring of 1899, he revealed to acquaintances in Flagstaff that he had a brother, Franz Wolf, a retired major general in the German army, who was planning to visit him. In late August of that year, Wolf traveled to Flagstaff, explaining that his brother was in San Francisco and would soon arrive. However, Wolf returned home seriously ill before his brother arrived. Despite his clerk's pleas, Wolf refused to let anyone send for a doctor. Finally, when Wolf lost consciousness, a message was sent to Flagstaff for a physician. His brother, having arrived in Flagstaff, joined Dr. Miller on the journey to Wolf's post, but they were too late. Herman Wolf passed away on September 3, 1899, just hours before they arrived. Herman Wolf was buried in the cemetery at Canyon Diablo. His tombstone gives his age at death as 69 years, which would place his birth year around 1830. However, this conflicts with accounts of his early life, including his rides with Kit Carson's mountain men. Many pioneers who knew Wolf in his later years insisted he was at least 90 when he died. The mystery of Wolf's buried treasure persisted after his death. The new operators of the trading post, George McAdams and S.I. Richardson, spent considerable time searching the area, turning over rocks and digging up the ground. They found evidence of old caches where something had been buried, but no treasure. What became of Wolf's savings reported to be considerable? The answer to this question, like much of Herman Wolf's life, remains a mystery. Herman Wolf's story is a testament to the rugged individualism and adaptability that characterized many pioneers of the American West. From fur trapper to Indian trader, he navigated the dangerous and rapidly changing landscape of the Southwest for over half a century. His trading post stood as a lone outpost of commerce in a wild land, bridging cultures and serving as a focal point for the region's tumultuous history. Wolf's life spanned a period of immense change, from the days of mountain men and beaver traps to the arrival of the railroad and the closing of the frontier. Through it all, he remained an enigmatic figure, leaving behind as many questions as answers. As we reflect on the story of Herman Wolf, we're reminded of the complex and often overlooked lives that shaped the American West. His legacy lives on in the stories, passed down through generations and in the very landscape he called home for so many years. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Southwest Desert. Until next time, keep exploring the rich history of the American Southwest. Welcome to the fascinating history of the Yuma Ferry, Fort Yuma, and the Yuma Massacre. Today, We'll explore the events that led to the establishment of this important military outpost on the Colorado River and the dramatic incidents that shaped its early years. Our story begins in February 1850, when John Glanton and his band of scalp-hunting renegades arrived at the Yuma crossing of the Colorado River. They immediately saw an opportunity in the ferry operation run by Dr. A. L. Lincoln. Glanton, a blackleg lawyer from Tennessee with a ruthless reputation, announced himself as a new partner who would ensure the ferry was managed properly. 
Glanton and his gang had a dark history. They had previously been hired by the state of Chihuahua in Mexico to collect Apache scalps, with prices ranging from $25 for children to $100 for men. However, their greed led them to start scalping Mexican citizens as well. When this was discovered, they fled to California, where they saw the ferry as their next source of easy money. Under Glanton's control, the ferry rates became exorbitant. The gang used gangster tactics to collect fares and ruthlessly eliminated any competition. This created a situation that would eventually require government intervention and lead to the establishment of Fort Yuma. Tension between the ferry operators and the local Yuma Native Americans came to a head on April 23, 1850. That morning, three white men from Glanton's band, William Carr, Marcus L. Webster, and Joseph A. Anderson, were suddenly attacked while cutting willow poles. They fled through the thickets, dodging arrows as they raced towards the ferry buildings. In a dramatic escape, the three men managed to reach a small boat and push off into the river. Little did they know, they were now the sole survivors of the Lincoln Glanton Ferry Company. Back at the ferry, Dr. Lincoln was asleep while Glanton and his men were in a drunken stupor. Led by Chief Caballo Sinpelo, the Yuma warriors attacked. Glanton was killed with a rock while Lincoln and the others were clubbed to death. The Native Americans even tied the company's dogs to the bodies of Lincoln and Glanton, burning them alive with the bodies in the ferry houses. This massacre was the culmination of growing tensions between the ferry operators and the Yuma tribe. The trouble had begun when a General Anderson from Tennessee refused to pay Glanton's high toll and instead built his own boat downstream. He then turned this ferry over to the Yumas, with the agreement that they would charge fair rates. Glanton, unwilling to tolerate competition, had the Yuma's hired ferrymen killed and destroyed their ferry. When Chief Caballo Sinpelo attempted to negotiate a compromise, Glanton made the fatal mistake of beating him and kicking him out. This insult to the Yuma leader sealed the fate of the white ferrymen on the Colorado. The three survivors, Carr, Webster, and Anderson, managed to escape downriver and eventually made their way to San Diego. On May 9, 1850, William Carr gave his account of the massacre to Alcalde Abel Stearns in Los Angeles. However, he didn't reveal all the details about the ferry company's mistreatment of the Yumas. The news of the massacre set wheels in motion. Governor Peter Burnett of California ordered the sheriffs of Los Angeles and San Diego counties to raise posses to establish law and order at the Colorado Crossing. A volunteer militia of 100 men was organized under Major General J.H. Bean and General Joseph C. Moorhead. This expedition, however, was plagued with problems from the start. The organizers struggled to acquire mounts from local rancheros, who were skeptical of the state scrip offered as payment. When Moorhead finally reached the Colorado, he found the Native Americans quiet and going about their business. This didn't sit well with some of the more aggressive militiamen, mostly emigrants from Arkansas and Missouri. Tensions escalated when a militiaman shot a Native American. Moorhead's attempt at diplomacy backfired when he told the Yuma leaders that the white men had come to treat or fight. The Yuma war chief Pasquale responded that while he wouldn't treat, he was willing to fight if that's what the white men wanted. Shortly after, 150 Native Americans armed with bows and arrows attacked the volunteer camp. 20 Native Americans were killed in the ensuing battle. Moorhead's force retreated to the stockade built by the ferry company, effectively ending what became known as the Moorhead War. This ill-fated expedition cost the state of California a total of $76,588.26, a significant sum at the time. The failure of the volunteer militia led to a more organized military response. In July 1850, Major Samuel P. Heinzleman, stationed in San Diego with a regular army unit, 
received orders to establish a permanent post at the junction of the Gila and Colorado Rivers. However, it wasn't until November 27, 1850, that Heinzelman and his force of U.S. regulars established their post at the mouth of the Gila. The initial site of the camp was about six miles below the present Fort Yuma Indian School. In March 1851, the command moved to higher ground, to the very spot where the ill-fated Mission de la Concepcion had once stood. This site had a tragic history of its own. It was where Padre Francisco Garces had died on July 19, 1781, during the Yuma Revolt. As the soldiers under Major Heinzelman and Lieutenant Thomas W. Sweeney laid out the future Fort Yuma, they cleared away the crumbling adobe and charcoal debris from the destroyed mission. The Commandant's headquarters was built on part of the old stone foundations of the mission. However, the new fort soon faced its own challenges. Provisions ran low and expected supply trains failed to arrive. In June 1851, Heinzelman was forced to fall back toward San Diego, leaving Lieutenant Sweeney with just ten men to hold the post. Sweeney, a fighting Irishman who had lost an arm in the Mexican War, managed to keep the Native Americans at bay by threatening to use his 12-pound field piece. But as provisions dwindled further, even Sweeney was eventually forced to abandon the post. Before leaving, he cached surplus government property, which the Native Americans promptly dug up and appropriated as soon as the soldiers were out of sight. The main difficulty in maintaining the post was the challenge of supplying it. To address this, a depot of supplies was established at Vallecito, and arrangements were made to send provisions by steamer to the mouth of the Colorado, and then upstream by riverboats. On February 29, 1852, Heinzelman and Sweeney returned to reoccupy the fort. This time, it was to be a permanent post. The soldiers were dismayed to find that the Native Americans had burned their previous willow pole and mud quarters, meaning they had to start construction all over again. In March, Heinzelman decided to end all Native hostilities in the vicinity of Fort Yuma. He sent out three detachments to scour the country between the two rivers and to the north of the post. However, these operations were hampered by supply issues. When a steamer carrying badly needed supplies failed to arrive, Heinzelman sent Major Fitzgerald with 24 men downstream to investigate. This detachment was ambushed 22 miles below Yuma, resulting in seven casualties. Despite these setbacks, by October 11, 1852, Major Heinzelman was able to issue an order announcing the termination of hostilities with the river tribesmen. He declared, The recent expedition has resulted in their entire subjection to the United States authority. To continue this good understanding, the Native Americans must be treated with justice and kindness. Although major Native American troubles had ceased, the garrison at Fort Yuma faced other challenges. On October 26, 1852, a fire broke out in the fort, destroying several buildings including the commissary storehouse. The blaze threatened to ignite barrels of cannon powder and boxes of ammunition. In a dramatic moment, Major Heinzelman and Lieutenant Sweeney rushed into the burning building to save the explosives, with only a few brave soldiers following them. As if the fire weren't enough, the post was rocked by a severe earthquake on November 29th. The tremors were so bad that sentries abandoned their post to huddle on the parade ground. Gigantic cracks opened in the ground, and the river behaved erratically. Relief came on December 3rd when the steamer Uncle Sam arrived with about 20 tons of commissary stores. This was the first steamer to navigate the river all the way to Fort Yuma, marking a significant improvement in the fort's supply situation. After the fire, efforts began to build a more substantial Fort Yuma. Adobe buildings were started, but progress was slow. It wasn't until late in 1854 that a large construction force arrived from San Diego to build the post under the supervision of D.B. Kurtz. 
By June 1855, work was well underway, continuing at a brisk rate despite the notorious Yuma heat. The heat at Fort Yuma was legendary, giving rise to several tall tales. One story claimed that a dog once ran across the parade ground on three legs, yelping at every jump because the ground was so hot. Another tale suggested that hens at Yuma laid hard-boiled eggs. Perhaps the most outrageous story was about an old soldier who died at Fort Yuma and went to hell, only to return the next night to get his blankets because hell was cooler. Despite these exaggerations, the heat was indeed extreme. On June 16, 1859, the thermometer registered 119 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest temperature recorded in nine years. By the outbreak of the Civil War, Fort Yuma had become a substantial post. It no longer relied on hauling water by cart from the river. The buildings were made of adobe, plastered inside and out. There were about 23 structures surrounding the flat, barren parade ground. In October and November 1861, redoubts, semicircular outposts with earthen embankments, were constructed to improve the fort's defenses. As the Native American threat diminished and the surrounding area became more settled, Fort Yuma's military importance began to wane. On July 17, 1884, the acting Secretary of War advised President Chester A. Arthur that Fort Yuma was no longer necessary as a military reservation. On July 22, 1884, the President transferred Fort Yuma to the Department of the Interior, and on July 28, an official order informed the Army that the post had ceased to exist. Fort Yuma's story didn't end there, however. On March 5, 1892, it became part of the Yuma Native American Reservation, bringing its history full circle. The fort, originally established in response to conflicts with the Yuma tribe, was now part of their protected lands. The story of Fort Yuma is a microcosm of the broader narrative of the American West. It encompasses themes of frontier justice, conflict between settlers and Native Americans, the challenges of establishing civilization in harsh environments, and the eventual pacification and settlement of the region. The fort's history reminds us of the complex and often violent processes that shape the American frontier. It stands as a testament to the resilience of both the soldiers who manned its walls and the Native Americans who called the surrounding lands home. Today, the site of Fort Yuma continues to overlook the Colorado River, a silent witness to the turbulent events that once unfolded along its banks. Thank you for joining us on this historical journey. Welcome to another episode of the Southwest Desert. I am your host, Alan. We will delve into early Southwest Desert pioneering and conflicts with the Mojave Native Americans. Also, we will cover the beginnings of Fort Mojave. If you enjoy this video, leave a like or comment. To continue our Southwest journeys, hit the subscribe button. In 1857, Congress approved $300,000 to build three wagon roads connecting the East and West Coasts of America. At the time, California newspaper editors complained this was far too little money for the massive project. But the country was divided over slavery, with some states threatening secession. Getting any federal money at all for Western infrastructure was fortunate. Army Lieutenant Edward Fitzgerald Beale was tasked with surveying a route for one of these roads, from Albuquerque to Los Angeles. He was allotted just $50,000 for a 1,500-mile road across barren desert and towering mountains. But Beale had faith the project would succeed. His proposed route followed Old Highway 66, swinging south past Inscription Rock and Zuni Pueblos in New Mexico, then crossing the high deserts of northern Arizona where water and grass could be found. The trail entered Mojave tribal lands along the Colorado River, where the natives guarded the fertile bottomlands and did not welcome outsiders. Seeing the need to protect immigrants who would soon use this road, Beale recommended establishing an army outpost at the river crossing. 
But action from Washington was slow. A year later, the first wagon train attempted Beale's route and the consequences were tragic. In spring 1858, a party of men, women, and children left Iowa to try the new Beale Road to California. At Albuquerque, they joined another group, bringing their number to 123 men, 33 women, and 47 children. Their journey grew difficult with scarce water and grazing. Reaching the Colorado River brought no relief, even though the shining ribbon of water was finally in view after days of thirst. It took three more agonizing days down precipitous terrain to actually reach the banks. They made camp in a stand of cottonwoods along the river. But while the immigrants rested, Mojave warriors swam the river and gathered on the far shore, bows held above water. The white travelers noticed, but did not expect real danger from natives with such primitive weapons. Their confidence was grievously misplaced. On August 1, 1858, at noon, the Mojave attackers hidden in the brush let fly a torrent of arrows into the exposed camp. Men scrambled for their rifles while women and children fled to shelter. The surprise was complete. The Mojave killed eight men from the rear wagons before warriors surfaced to stop the rest from reinforcing their comrades. The immigrants were outmatched, but they put up a bitter defense, fighting for their lives as afternoon wore on. The Mojave finally withdrew at sunset, driving off most of the livestock, their victory complete. Half the immigrants were wounded. With so little left, the pioneers reluctantly retreated towards Albuquerque that night, carrying their casualties and expecting ambush at any moment. Back at the campsite, the Mojave celebrated by burning the abandoned wagons and supplies. After further deprivation, the tattered remnants of the wagon train finally reached safety. Their terrible experience galvanized public support for army intervention. By December, Mass meetings produced a resolution calling for a military post on the Colorado River to pacify the Mojave. This time, there was no delay. In early 1859, four companies of Army infantry embarked by ship for the Colorado River Delta. It was hardly an easy deployment. The ships ran aground. Then soldiers packed into shallow draft paddle wheelers had to slog through 200 miles of shifting sandbars just to reach Fort Yuma. Temperatures over 90 degrees racked the men used to San Francisco's cool climate. They even named their miserable encampment Camp Dirty. Finally, orders arrived to march upriver into Mojave lands. No tents or excess gear came along. Each man hauled his own kit through the barren landscape. The 6th Infantry's veterans mocked the steaming flats near the Colorado as worse than Mexico or Utah. But under experienced mountain guides, David McKenzie and the famous Joe Walker, they followed the river north, skirting the villages of peaceful Chimehuevi people. Strange glyphs and medicine signs also appeared, possibly meant to hex the soldiers' passage. On April 17th, emissaries from the Mojave tribe arrived, expecting to meet Colonel Hoffman, self-styled Chief of the Tall White Hat. Hoffman informed them he would hold council with their leaders on the 23rd, near Beale's fateful crossing. There, a field of broken wagons and household ruins still lay, including the cottonwood tree where the first emigrant died. It was a charged location for negotiations. On the 23rd, some 500 Mojave gathered as Colonel Hoffman formally raised the U.S. flag for the first time in their lands. A brush arbor kept the sun off attendees. Six Mojave headmen, including one leader called Kairuk, attended. There was tension as armed soldiers subtly ringed the area, provoking consternation among the natives. The council itself was frustrated by language barriers. An elder of the Yuma tribe played interpreter between English, Spanish, Yuma, and finally Mojave leaders. Colonel Hoffman bluntly threatened destruction upon the Mojave if they continued attacks. 
They must surrender both the ringleaders responsible for the emigrant attack and members of prominent families as hostages of good behavior. Extreme terms indeed, but the numerically weaker Mojave ultimately acquiesced. Nine of their chiefs went as prisoners to Fort Yuma in irons. This was clearly conquest by intimidation. In subsequent days, the army selected a site for its new outpost, disregarding pleas to instead locate on the far shore. Their reasoning is unclear, but they prioritize proximity to the emigrant trail and Colorado River crossing. With raw materials from the floodplain forest, Fort Mojave rose swiftly. But the heat was just as intense as summer came on. Thermometers read 118 degrees in the shade. Duty here was punishment for man and beast alike. The post was operational for just two years before events in the East took precedence. In 1861, during the opening months of the Civil War, federal troops were ordered away to protect Southern California from secessionist intrigues. Quickly, the Mojave resumed their former habits of raiding both settlers and travelers. Only in 1863 did soldiers grudgingly return to man Fort Mojave once more. A visitor in 1871 left us a description of this sun-baked sentinel. It is about seven miles below Hardyville, close to the Colorado River and hotter than the hinges of any preacher's hell. It is a well-built, clean, comfortable post, and we may suppose far preferable as a summer residence to hell or Fort Yuma, although its occupants claim it is hotter than either of those places. Indeed, Major Pond, the gentlemanly commandant, assured us that he had frequently seen the mercury rise up to stand at 118 degree in the shade. Surely the troops garrisoning this remote outpost paid heavily in human suffering to realize America's vision of manifest destiny. Their sacrifices brought the first permanent colonial foothold into Mojave tribal lands. While securing vital routes for American commerce and migration, the Post also foretold the inevitable decline for the Mojave way of life along their ancestral river valley. We remember the soldiers' endurance, but should also commemorate the price in autonomy paid by Native peoples encountering an irresistible tide of cultural conquest from the East. Few events encapsulate so neatly the costs and benefits of America's march to the Pacific, making Fort Mojave's origins well worth understanding by Western historians and enthusiasts today. Welcome to Southwest Desert, the channel that uncovers the hidden gems of American Southwest history. Today, we're venturing into the heart of the American Southwest to explore a military outpost that played a pivotal role in shaping the region's destiny. Join us as we unravel the fascinating story of Fort Union, New Mexico. Picture this, a vast, arid landscape stretching as far as the eye can see. The year is 1851, and in the newly acquired territory of New Mexico, a fortress is rising from the dusty earth. This is Fort Union, a place that would soon become one of the most important military outposts west of the Mississippi River. But why here? Why now? To understand the significance of Fort Union, we need to step back and look at the bigger picture of mid-19th century America. For more than two decades before the American occupation of New Mexico in 1846, wagon trains had been traversing the Santa Fe Trail. This vital commercial artery connected the American frontier in Missouri with the Mexican cities of Santa Fe and Chihuahua. It was a lucrative but dangerous route, with traders accepting the risks of Native American raids and other hazards as part of the cost of doing business. But everything changed when General Stephen W. Kearney marched into Santa Fe in 1846, planting the stars and stripes and declaring American sovereignty over the region. With this act, he inadvertently set in motion a chain of events that would lead to the creation of Fort Union. You see, Kearney had made a bold promise to the citizens of Santa Fe. They could now look to him for protection. It was a promise easier made than kept. The territory was vast, encompassing not just present-day New Mexico, 
but also all of Arizona north of the Gila River, southern Nevada, and part of Colorado. Fort Marcy in Santa Fe simply couldn't stretch its resources thin enough to police this enormous area effectively. Meanwhile, the Santa Fe Trail was busier than ever, but the character of those traveling it had changed. Gone were the hardy, respectful traders of old. In their place came a new breed of frontiersmen, trigger-happy and all too ready to shoot first and ask questions later. Their reckless behavior, particularly towards Native Americans and Buffalo, inevitably led to retaliation and escalating violence along the trail. The cries for protection grew louder, and Congress finally listened. In September 1851, construction began on Fort Union. Its mission was twofold, to serve as the headquarters of the 9th Military Department of the United States Army and to act as a supply center for 40 to 50 smaller forts scattered across a 500-mile radius. But building a fort of this magnitude in such an isolated location was no small feat. A memorial to Congress from New Mexico's territorial legislature in 1853 paints a vivid picture of just how remote this area was. The road to Missouri is the great business thoroughfare of the territory. The distance from Fort Union to Independence is more than 700 miles, and on this long and dreary line of road there is but a single military station, a single Indian trading post where travelers receive any assistance in their greatest need. Can you imagine? It took three months or more just to receive a reply to a letter sent east of Independence or San Antonio. The isolation was almost total. Yet, against all odds, Fort Union rose from the desert floor. And what a sight it must have been. Spread across a reservation eight miles square, the fort was a small city unto itself, built at a cost of about one-third of a million dollars, a staggering sum for the time. It boasted barracks for enlisted men, attractive quarters for officers and their families, and housing for civilian employees. But that was just the beginning. The fort also featured mess halls, kitchens, a bakery, a large, well-equipped hospital, and an impregnable guardhouse. There was even a brick kiln and sawmill on site. And let's not forget the stables, large enough to accommodate 1,000 mules and horses, and warehouses capable of storing 2,000 tons of hay and a mind-boggling 2 million bushels of grain. By the 1860s, Fort Union was a hive of activity, employing around 1,000 people, harness makers, repairmen, wheelwrights, wagon makers, blacksmiths, carpenters, and general laborers all found work here. The Sutler's Store, a civilian-run general store serving the military community, was doing brisk business, averaging $3,000 in daily sales. But Fort Union wasn't just a military installation. It was a community. Married officers brought their families, and soon the fort was alive with the sounds of everyday life. Weddings, christenings, dances, box socials, ball games, any excuse for a celebration was seized upon with enthusiasm. A Masonic Lodge was established, complete with its own hall on the grounds. Before long, this outpost in the dry plains of northern New Mexico boasted the largest white population of any city between the Mississippi River and the Pacific Coast. It was a slice of civilization carved out of the wilderness. But life at Fort Union wasn't all celebrations and community events. The fort played a crucial role in some of the most tumultuous events of 19th century American history. First came the ongoing conflicts with Native American tribes. The fort's soldiers were frequently called upon to engage in what were often bloody encounters with hostile Native Americans and border ruffians. These skirmishes were a constant reminder of the tension simmering just beyond the fort's walls. And then came the Civil War. In 1862, the conflict that had torn the nation apart finally reached New Mexico. The Confederate Army, led by General Henry Hopkins Sibley, marched westward out of Texas with a force of 2,300 troops. Their advance seemed unstoppable. 
Albuquerque fell on February 21st, Santa Fe on March 10th. The gray-clad soldiers rolled over New Mexico like an unstoppable juggernaut. But Sibley's ultimate prize lay ahead, Fort Union. Unlike Albuquerque and Santa Fe, which had fallen without a fight, Fort Union was prepared to defend itself. As the Confederates approached, the fort's commander made a bold decision. Instead of waiting for the enemy to come to them, the Union forces would meet them head on. On March 26, 1862, the two armies clashed at Apache Canyon, 45 miles southwest of Fort Union. The battle was fierce and bloody. When the smoke cleared, 32 Confederate soldiers lay dead, 43 were wounded, and 71 had been taken prisoner. Fort Union's losses were lighter, but they too had paid a price for their victory. The fighting wasn't over. Two days later, another battle erupted at nearby Pigeon's Ranch. Shortly after, Union forces destroyed a Confederate supply train camped at Cannoncito. These successive blows forced General Sibley to fall back to Santa Fe, and soon after, to retreat entirely from New Mexico. The significance of this victory cannot be overstated. In failing to capture Fort Union, the Confederacy's plans to conquer the Southwest were frustrated. Some historians even argue that this failure may have changed the entire course of the Civil War. In the years following the Civil War, Fort Union continued to play a vital role in the American Southwest. Throughout the 1860s and 1870s, troops from the fort took part in numerous operations against various Native American tribes. The Apaches, Navajos, Cheyenne, Arapahoes, Kiowas, Utes, and Comanches all felt the might of Fort Union's military power. These campaigns were relentless and by the spring of 1875 had brought peace to the Southern Plains, but on the white man's terms. It was a peace bought at a terrible cost to the Native American way of life. As the Indian Wars wound down, Fort Union's role began to change. Its soldiers were now more likely to be called upon to track down outlaws, quell mob violence, or mediate feuds. The days of large-scale military operations were coming to an end. But even as its military importance waned, Fort Union's role as a supply depot continued to flourish. That is, until 1879, when progress arrived in the form of the Santa Fe Railroad. The Iron Horse had finally outpaced the wagon train, and the Santa Fe Trail, the lifeline that had given birth to Fort Union, was rendered obsolete. The writing was on the wall. By 1891, Fort Union had outlived its usefulness. The fortress that had once been the largest and most important military outpost west of the Mississippi was abandoned, its buildings left to the mercy of the harsh New Mexico elements. Today, Fort Union stands as a silent sentinel to a bygone era. Its adobe walls, weathered by time and the elements, still whisper tales of the soldiers, settlers, and Native Americans who shaped the destiny of the American Southwest. But the legacy of Fort Union lives on, not just in the ruins that still dot the landscape, but in the very fabric of New Mexico and the surrounding states. The fort played a crucial role in opening up the West for American settlement, for better or worse. It was a catalyst for change, a harbinger of the new order that would reshape the American frontier. As we reflect on the history of Fort Union, we're reminded of the complex tapestry of American history. It's a story of ambition and progress, of conflict and cooperation, of triumph and tragedy. In many ways, the story of Fort Union is the story of America itself, a nation forged in the crucible of the frontier, always pushing westward, always seeking new horizons. Before we close, let's take a moment to remember some of the notable figures who walked the grounds of Fort Union. General Edward Richard Sprigg Canby, who would later be killed while negotiating peace with the Modoc tribe in California, served here. So too did Kit Carson, 
the legendary frontiersman whose name became synonymous with the American West. Even some future Civil War legends pass through Fort Union. Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, before he earned his famous nickname, spent time here. So did John A. Logan, who would go on to become a Union general and later a U.S. senator. And let's not forget Ulysses S. Grant, the man who would lead the Union to victory in the Civil War and later become President of the United States. Grant is said to have returned to Fort Union in later years, drawn back by the memory of the lift of the High Mesa with its illimitable views. As we leave Fort Union behind, let's carry with us the lessons it offers. Let's remember the courage of those who built a community in the wilderness, the sacrifices made in times of war, and the complex, often painful process of nation building. But let's also remember the cost of that progress, the displacement of native peoples, the violence of conquest, and the irreversible changes wrought upon the land. Fort Union may be gone, but its story, our story, lives on. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the heart of American Southwest history. Until next time, this has been the Southwest Desert. Welcome to this episode on the fascinating history of Vallecito Stage Station, a crucial waypoint for travelers in the American Southwest during the 19th century. Today, we'll take you on a journey through time, exploring the rich tapestry of events and characters that made Vallecito a vital link in early American westward expansion. Our story begins in 1782, when Don Pedro Fajes, a Spanish military officer, stumbled upon a small green valley nestled among the arid canyons of what is now Southern California. Fajes and his troops were on a mission to capture deserters from the San Diego Presidio when they made this unexpected discovery. Faze, astride his horse, cresting a rise after a long, dusty journey. Below them lies a sight that must have seemed like a mirage, a lush, green valley, an emerald oasis amidst the golden desolation of the desert. Faez, overcome with excitement, exclaims to his men, Amigos, our search is ended. Where else could our scoundrels hide? In the midst of all this desolation, water, water and feed enough for a whole army. Realizing the significance of their find, Fajes declares, Even the great Juan Bautista de Anza, bringing our people across the deserts from Sonora, knew naught of this oasis. It is for me, Pedro Fajes, to discover it. Gem more precious than mountains of rubies, I name thee simply Little Valley, Vallecito. Thus Vallecito entered the annals of recorded history, but its story was just beginning. For centuries before Fajes' discovery, Vallecito had been a camping ground for roving desert peoples. Its reliable water source made it a natural stopping point for travelers. However, it wasn't until 1826 that a trail was blazed through from Sonora by Romualdo Pancheco, establishing the first overland mail service into Alta California that passed through Vallecito. In the years that followed, American adventurers began making their own trails across the Colorado Desert. Many who heeded the call to California found the southern desert route, with its unfailing waters at Vallecito, more attractive than braving the snows of the high Sierras. Vallecito's unique geography made it a natural link in the chain of valleys that form the southern immigrant trail. The towering Laguna Mountains looming above, their feet dipped in the green river of salt grass and tools that ran through the valley. Mesquite trees, typically scrubby in the desert, here grew large enough to provide shade. Acotillo and cactus spread a gorgeous, colorful garden leading up to the barren hills that enclosed the valley. This oasis in the desert soon became a crucial waypoint for various expeditions and migrations. In 1846, General Stephen Kearney rested his fatigued army here during one of the most difficult and unnecessary forced marches in history. The following year, the Whipple Boundary Survey Party, guided by Colonel Cave J. Coutts, made camp at Vallecito. But it was the California Gold Rush that truly put Vallecito on the map. In 1849, 
a vigorous stream of humanity poured through the quiet little valley, headed for the gold fields of California. The peaceful oasis became a bustling way station, echoing with the sounds of wagon wheels, livestock, and the excited chatter of gold seekers dreaming of riches. As California grew in population and importance, the need for regular communication with the East became paramount. In 1857, just three decades after the first overland mail service from Sonora, the U.S. government awarded a contract for the first American transcontinental mail service. The man chosen for this monumental task was James E. Birch. Despite being only in his 20s, Birch was already the owner and operator of 3,000 miles of stage lines in California. In June 1857, in his San Francisco office, Birch laid out his plans to R.E. Doyle, one of his most trusted employees. Doyle, Birch said, I want you ready with pack mules to leave San Diego for Tucson. When Doyle expressed surprise, thinking the terminus would be in Sacramento via Salt Lake City, Birch explained that the southern route was preferred by the government. Comanches, Apaches, deserts, or what have you, Birch declared, banging his fist on the desk. The overland mail leaves San Diego east, San Antonio west, on July 24th. Birch knew the stakes were high. Butterfield wants this contract, he told Doyle, referring to John Butterfield, a close friend of the president. It'll be nip and tuck if we keep it. I've put my most reliable men on the job, and I'm counting on you, Doyle. Doyle wasted no time. He purchased supplies in San Francisco and took a boat to San Diego, where he had just three days to find mules if he was to leave on schedule. Despite his best efforts, it wasn't until August 9th that his mule train was ready, and he set out on the epic-making journey with the first eastbound overland mail. While all this was happening, Vallecito had not been entirely a place for passers-through. Since 1851, it had boasted one permanent dwelling, a sod house built by James R. Lassator. The Lassators owned a ranch in Green Valley near Cuyamaca Mountain, but during the travel season, they found it profitable to sell provisions and hay to immigrants in Vallecito. Little did the Lassiters know that their modest sod house was about to become one of the most important stations for a transcontinental stagecoach line. On September 7, 1857, two bedraggled riders and an exhausted pack mule appeared in Vallecito. These men were J.C. Woods, the superintendent of Birch's mail service project, and his companion. They had hoped to find fresh horses at the Lassator store, but found it deserted. With no other choice, they pushed on to the Lassator's ranch in Green Valley. At two in the morning, the Lassiters were awakened by loud pounding on their door. There stood Woods, demanding fresh horses at once. As James Lassiter grudgingly offered the visitors a place to sleep, Woods began to explain the momentous changes that were about to sweep through Vallecito. The overland mail was now a reality and the Lassator's Vallecito store would become one of its stations. They would serve meals to stagecoach passengers and supply feed for the horses. The potential for profit was enormous. Woods reached San Diego the next night, greeted by jubilant crowds ringing bells and waving flags. It was September 8th, and the first overland mail had made it through. In his government report, Woods wrote, I myself had come from San Antonio to San Diego in 38 days. However, Wood's triumph was tempered by disappointment. He had expected to meet Birch in San Diego with money for his return trip. But Birch was not there. It was only later that Woods learned the tragic news. Birch had sailed for Boston on August 20th, and the ship, the Central America, had sunk off Cape Hatteras. Birch had drowned. Despite this setback, the mail service pushed forward. On October 17th, an advertisement appeared in California papers. This line, which has been in successful operation since July, is ticketing passengers. Passengers and express by coach and six mules except across the Colorado desert cross by muleback. 
This last detail, crossing the Colorado desert by muleback, gave this historic overland mail service its colloquial name, the Jackass Mail. For James Lassiter, the establishment of the mail service was a dream come true. His little Valacito store was now a bustling stage station. After John Butterfield took over the franchise in 1858, the number of stage runs increased until there were coaches passing through six days a week, connecting Independence, Missouri, and Los Angeles. But the Lassiter story at Vallecito began even before the mail service. In an immigrant train that had passed through Vallecito prior to 1854, there had been the wagon of the Mulkins family. The father, Mulkins, had been shot during an attack on the train out in the desert. John Mulkins, a serious-faced boy in his early teens, was carrying on in his father's place while his mother looked after the three smaller children. James Lassiter, watching the Mulkins family make camp by the salt-grass Sienega, found he could not forget the patient face of the dark-eyed little widow. After the Mulkins family had moved on to San Diego, Lassiter began adding living quarters to his little store. When summer began to slow down travel, he rode into San Diego and married Mrs. Mulkins. Life at the Vallecito stage station was a whirlwind of activity and excitement. There was constant contact with important personages from the east and from the coast. As tensions between north and south grew, travelers brought news and newspapers which were eagerly seized and read. The outbreak of the Civil War brought sudden changes to Vallecito. Travel stopped abruptly as troops were removed from Arizona, allowing the Apaches to pour out of their strongholds. The sudden silence in the remote Vallecito outpost was oppressive. In this lull, James Lassiter decided to try his luck at prospecting. He went with a friend to Arizona, and word soon came back that they had located a mine, Expectations were high that Lassiter would return to Vallecito a rich man. But fate had other plans. News arrived that Lassiter and his friend had been found murdered and robbed by bandits. John Mulkins, Lassiter's stepson, immediately left for Arizona to avenge his stepfather's death. But despite his efforts, no trace of the murderers could be found. Devastated by the loss, Mrs. Lassiter closed the station and moved the equipment to Camp Wright at Oak Grove. When travel resumed in 1863, she sold the station to John Hart. Time marched on, and the coming of the railroads eventually rendered the stagecoach lines obsolete. But Vallecito's place in history was not forgotten. In 1939, the Vallecito stage station was accepted by the state of California as one of nine historic spots in Southern California to be set aside for official registration as a state monument. The original sod house had fallen into ruin, but thanks to the efforts of Dr. and Mrs. Louis Strawman, along with other interested parties and government agencies, it was rebuilt. The last chapter of our story belongs to James E. Mason, a man who had once been a driver on the Jackass Mail and had served in the Union Army. Mason was living in the station and running stock when the government survey was made. He filed on the land and became the first legal owner of Vallecito. The restored depot stands as a testament to the courage and determination of the pioneers who braved the harsh desert to connect a growing nation. It is dedicated quite appropriately, to James E. Birch, the man who put the empire on wheels. As we conclude our journey through the history of Vallecito Stage Station, we're reminded of the vital role these remote outposts played in the expansion and development of the American West. From Don Pedro Fage's chance discovery to its days as a crucial link in the transcontinental mail service, Vallecito has witnessed the sweep of history. Thank you for joining us on this journey through time. I hope you enjoyed these Lost Desert Tales. If you would like to help support my time and channel, hit the Super Thanks Heart icon on the bottom of the video and contribute. This is very helpful. Happy Trails.